What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Love Unscripted Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my esteemed co-host, Dexter J. Tucker. What's going on, fam? How y'all feel? And this is the podcast where we have unscripted conversations with millennials about relationships and dating. So I hope you guys are having a great start to your week. Hopefully, fall hasn't come up on you too quickly. I know people are starting to have to pull out the hoodies, maybe having to pull out the beanie, something. Like, I felt, I, I'm starting to feel these cool breezes in the morning. So it's, it's a little <laughs> shocking. So I don't know where you're at in the country. I know up north, a lot of people are probably already like, man, we've been had chill weather. But down here in the South, we are not used to it like that. And when it sneaks up on you, it, it, it sends them chills. So wherever you're at, I hope you're having a good start to your week. Uh, Dexter, how you been? I've been good. It's still hot in Houston, so I haven't had a, a chill sneak up on me yet. But when it does, whew, I look forward to it. Definitely, definitely. So if you guys missed last week's episode, yo, you missed a really good one. We were joined by Brenton Harrison, who's a financial advisor and helps millennials manage their finances. And we talked about what do you do when you and your partner have different spending habits and have different ideas about money? So we had a really dope conversation about what does money mean to certain people? And more importantly, how you could actually have the conversation around money so that it does not deter your financial goals and it does not tear you and your partner apart. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that one, I'm OK. Go ahead. Stop. Pause this one. Go listen to that one. And that way you can be caught up. So, Dexter, what's been going on in your world? Like. What have you been seeing recently that's caught your mind or caught your eye as far as relationships recently? I like to check in with people because I think as we go on in life, we start to see different things. Have you seen anything different lately? I've seen anything different lately. Whew. Outside of this war between men and women, outside of that, that's pretty much been it. The war of what do you bring to the table going back and forth. That's the biggest thing I've seen. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but you know what's funny? I think we have been doing a good job of staying out of that and being yeah. in the space where we are very much like self-improvement, mm -hmm. like self-interest, like introspection has been our calling card. And I started to get messages from people saying that, hey, we're using the podcast at our college and universities as a talking point, as in like a podcasting. What is it called? Like a book club. But it's with wow. the podcast. And I'm like, yo, people are able to use this as a way to take in information and then dialogue about it. People are now having the conversation on the university level, which is crazy to me that something that started almost three years ago is now something, a tool that people are using and finding valuable so much so that they're getting other people together and say, hey, let's talk about these episodes and see how they can um improve our life and how we can go on this journey of love together. So we got like, we know why you guys are here and we are here for great conversations and we're going to keep it up. So I have another really great guest. I've been super excited to have this person on. So let me go ahead and get them in here. All right. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, what's going on, man? So happy to be here. I am Paul. Bashe Williams. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a psychotherapist, the, the author of Dear Future Wife, A Man's God and Woman's Reference to Healthy Relationships. I'm a speaker. Um, I'm a supervisor. I supervise clinicians. Um, I'm, I'm married to the wonderful Tara Gates Williams. Always got to give her a shout out. And we co-own One Love Alliance, which is a, a movement, a ministry where we try to help people with their relationships, like real practical tools, like real stuff. No fluffy, no sugar coating, but being real and, and being able to provide people with practical tools to have healthy relationships. Man, I love it. If you guys are not aware of their movement, like I literally, like I be sneaking into y'all clubhouses. <laughs> the clubhouse <laughs> they be lit. I, I love the, like hearing you guys, um, the dialogue. I think the dialogue between couples is so unique and so insightful because people don't always get to know what it's like on the inside. We know what people post on social media. Right. We know what's on Instagram. But that's not always like what's going on behind closed doors. So if you once you guys, I poke, I poke, I look, I will post his information in the show notes, and you guys can definitely follow his movement. So we got some questions for you that are some get to know you. So as a therapist, one of the I guess practices that I strongly believe in is self-care. 
So okay. what are some things that you do for your self-care routine that help you recharge when you feel like your spiritual, yeah. emotional, physical battery is going low? Hello? Are you seeing him, Dexter? Absolutely. That was so important because at the moment of burnout, I realized when I went to my therapist, um, and he was telling me that I was exhausted. Can you hear me? So so it looks like it's messy. Can you hear me? No, we can't. It's breaking up pretty bad. Can you hear me? It's breaking up really bad. Can y'all hear me? Hello. No, hold on. Can can you can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear him, but it's just breaking up real bad. It's like he's he's frozen. That is. Uh, okay. Uh, Let me remove him and bring him back in. Hey, hey, Karen. What's your uh, Wi-Fi? Oh, okay. You have an iPhone, All right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty choppy. Yeah. Get out of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. So what we'll do is he'll probably um, go out and then come back in, and then I'll just edit this part out. Okay. Gotcha. So I can edit. I'm gonna just keep it rolling. Go with the intro. See if um, when he comes back. Okay. I'm going to put us on mute. Okay. Testing. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. We yes. can't hear you. Yeah. I don't know. We just had a wave and all Wi-Fi was just gone. So I don't <laughs> know what just happened. 
Yo, you know, technology is supposed to make things easier. Not harder. Right. 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 All right. So what we'll do is we'll just redo it. Um, we're gonna start back from the beginning and we're just gonna start back over. Okay. All, All right, right. Cool. we'll put you in the back chat. All right, so Dexter, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. All right, so we're gonna start back in about um about 20 seconds. That way it's okay. at the 11 minute mark, and that okay. way I'll just edit from there. Edit from there, okay. Yeah. Ten seconds. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Level Scripted Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Wilson, and I'm joined by my esteemed co-host, Dexter J. Tucker. What's going on, fam? How y'all feel? And this is the podcast where we have unscripted conversations with millennials about relationships and dating. So I hope you guys are having an amazing start to your week. Hopefully you didn't have to warm up your car because it got a little chilly. I know the northerners are starting to already pull out the hoodies and coats. I don't think they got the bubble coats just yet. It's not that cold, <laughs> but it's enough for hoodie season, which y'all know is my favorite season of all. So Dexter, how are you doing this week? I'm so good. good. I haven't had to crank up the car. I'm warm the car yet because I'm in Houston, so it's still hot. So I'm all good. Right, right. See, the South, it, it, they're delayed. <laughs> Y'all will get snow after everybody else gets it. And then oh, wonder. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so so if you guys missed last week's episode, yo, you missed a treat. So we were joined by Brenton Harrison, who's a financial advisor. And we had a very dope conversation about what to do when you and your partner have different spending habits. We had a deep conversation about what money tends to mean to people and more so how to have conversations around money so that money does not pull you apart, so that money does not become a headache. Because as we know, the bills come every 1st and 15th. So if they come that often, we may as well figure out a way to communicate in a in such a manner that it just becomes a routine rather than a headache. So if you haven't listened to that episode, go ahead and pause and listen to that one so you can continue the conversation there. So we are going to keep these amazing, great, candid conversations flowing. And we have another great guest who's gonna be joining us this week. So let me go ahead and get them in here. All right, so guests, introduce yourself. Hey, what's going on, man? Happy to be here. I am Paul Bache Williams. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, the author of Hearts and Mind. I'm sorry, that's my name, my, my practice, Hearts and Mind Counseling. But I'm the author of Dear Future Wife, A Man's Guide and Woman's Reference to Healthy Relationships. I'm also the co-founder with my lovely wife, Targates Williams of When Love Align. Our ministry, our movement, we talk about relationships, helping people repair, helping people restore, helping people get themselves together before they even get into relationships. Um, so it's, it's about the tips and the tools that are practical. And that's what we try to teach. And we try to be very open and honest and candid about our relationship blunders and also what we need to do in order to maintain ours. I love it. I love it. I love practical knowledge. and I love practical tools because so much information can be philosophical and theoretical and it sounds good. I actually want to get to the place that a lot of these quotes are talking about, but how do I get there? So listen, you guys' movement is doing amazing things. I will definitely be tagging your information so others can follow your journey. So we are going to go ahead. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I, I, I got to say it. We have another therapist on the podcast. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, maybe I'm biased. Maybe I'm partial to our view and our perspective, but I just really enjoy having clinicians who actually sit with people who get to hear the real conversation and then can also give tools and strategies that are not just our opinion. There's research and studies that back up the tools and strategies that we try to give people. So I just wanted to say that I had to put that out there. Um, <laughs> so Let's get to know our guests a little bit better. So as a therapist, I'm always an advocate for self-care. I think it's extremely important for people not to just have self-care acts, but have self-care routines and self-care practices. So for you, what is something that you do that helps recharge you mentally, physically, spiritually when your battery starts to get a little low? So the biggest thing, I, well, I'm going to give you a couple of different things I do. So Mondays in general, as Monday is my self-care day. So everything is shut down on Monday. I get to do whatever I need to do, whatever I want to do. 
if I want to stay in the bed until one o'clock, I'll stay in the bed until one o'clock. What the, my, my wife says, I'm still sitting in the hotel. The, the shades are closed. I got the movies. Like if I want to get up at, and I'll even say this, if I, if I want to have a uh, mimosa on a, at 11 o'clock or 9 a.m. on a Monday, that's my day. I get to do whatever I need because I need to recharge. I need to recalibrate. I need to be able to show up for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the rest of the week as a husband, as a father, as a clinician, as a friend, as a brother, as a son, all those different things. Monday is my day to do whatever I need. Um, and that's just something simple. The other thing I do is my phone goes on, goes on, do not disturb at eight o'clock. Nobody has access to me. Nobody really, I don't, I don't think anybody really needs me after eight o'clock. Like, and I don't want any client calls or, or business opportunities or whatever that is eight o'clock. I need to shut down because I need to get rid of the day. So I do that, that brain dump. I do whatever I need to do at eight o'clock and that that set a boundary and it's on my answer machine as well. The Monday is on my answer machine, and so is the 8 o'clock on my answer machine. So people aren't wrestling with me. They're wrestling with my voicemail. They're wrestling with my boundary. And that's oh. it. And I don't take it personal. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah. You not only have your own self-care day, but you set up parameters to make sure that it's in force. That's great because there are going to be people who... They, they don't care that you're trying to practice self-care. They will try to contact you. Hey, can you help me with this? I need some advice on this. I need this. It Putting up that boundary protects you in your mental state. I love it. So question number two, our audience loves food. They're big foodies. We can try to put food in any conversation <laughs> we have if we wanted to. So are you more of a hole in the wall uh, kind of person? Or do you like five star fine dining when it comes to your food selection? I'm not, I'm not in part, I'm not partial to it. Like I will go anywhere. Like I, I grew up in the hood, so I'm used to that, you know, and I had my struggle meals when I didn't have money. So I can't act like I can't eat, you know, you know the hole in the walls, whatever. And sometimes they have so many good flavors in there, right? When they don't change the grease, right? You you got you got this, you got the chicken and the fish with the same grease. You know those joints are good, but I love me a, a fine restaurant with a good steak, um, with some you know Brussels with with the bacon in it or some you know caviar, whatever it is. I like to treat myself to that too. That's part of my self care. Just going to a fine restaurant, and before I was married, I would take myself out there and just go by myself and just enjoy the experience. Got you. Got you. So question three, this may be a tough one. Um, I'm, and I'm not trying to get you in trouble in any kind of way. So we're, we're, <laughs> I've been having this conversation with a couple of my friends. And here's the question. If your partner is watching a Netflix series with you and they do not initiate to watch the show for upwards of three days and you're binging a series, is it OK to go ahead and continue the series if they have not mentioned it, have not told you to hold on, have not told you let's schedule a date to catch back up. Is it wrong to go ahead and watch the show anyway? Well, I'm going to tell you this. This is what my wife does. She doesn't wait. Three days is, is a long time. If you don't mention it the next day, she's already on episode 13 and we're supposed to be on episode two. So I kind of just give up and watching my own stuff. So you know, it, it really depends. I mean, it's, it's technically wrong. We're watching it together. But, you know, she I, I just got my head out of that. She's on, again. There's so many different <laughs> series that we're supposed to be watching together. She already finished. And she was wow. like, I, have, I don't have time to wait for y'all. Like, that's what she says to the house. It, it's funny that I don't even want to watch. It'd be something that she wants to watch. She brings me in and then I'm forced. And then finally I get settled in watching it. And then she'll watch the whole thing. <laughs> See, these are the things that I'm talking about that no one really talks about. The show that you didn't really want to watch, but you got dragged into it. And so now you're like, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. So thank you for being willing to share some of that information with us. Hopefully our guests get to know you a little bit better. But we're going to go ahead and jump straight into the topic. And I think it's right in alignment with something that you said as far as preparing for that next relationship. So I'm going to set it up this way. One of my favorite things to do is travel. I love to get out and see new sites. I love to go see museums. I love to try new foods. As a child, I used to really enjoy when I used to go visit my dad for the summer, and he would let me know beforehand that we are planning on taking a trip 
somewhere else. Now, the idea of the trip was really fun. It was really exciting. I was super hyped. But the problem is he would tell me about this trip in January, but it wasn't until July. So as a result, I had a destination in mind, but I was stuck living out every single day waiting for it to get here. It felt like torture. It almost got to the point sometimes where it's like, you know what? It's so far away. I don't even care if we go or not. The excitement that I once had is now gone. And I think a lot of people, while they're waiting for a relationship, are struggling with that time in between where they actually get to the relationship and where they currently are. So let's start right here. So, and, and, and we'll start with you, Paul. So why do you think some people are so in a rush to get into a relationship? I think a lot of people don't like spending a long time with themselves. Some people struggle with that. And some people are looking for something to fill a void when they need to be concentrating and working on themselves. So if I'm, if I have, like, and I say dating from a deficit. So at, at one point I felt like I was dating from a deficit. I wanted to, uh, I guess, travel a lot, but I didn't have maybe the means. And so maybe I dated someone who's in the travel industry industry that made it easier, right? So I want to do these different things. So I'm dating to what I don't have. And what I encourage people to do is try to find ways to really enjoy the time that you have, because right now you're not at a destination. You're just at a position. You're in a position. The singleness is a position, right? And so you talked about going out to eat, right? I, what do I really like without the distraction of somebody else? What do I like about the ambiance? What do I like about getting there? Am I paying attention to the steps and really enjoying the different things that I'm doing to get to that particular destination? Because we can jump into a relationship and not necessarily be ready for it because we don't know what we like. And we're telling somebody we like this thing and they're giving it to us, but we don't really like it because we haven't spent time with it. And, and you know what's funny about that? One of the top questions that people tend to argue about is, the man will say, hey, what do you want to eat? And the woman will say, well, I don't know what to eat. And I was just thinking if everybody took time to actually know what it is they like to eat or the types of foods, then the woman could also could offer suggestions about what she may want to eat. But the guy doesn't have to be stuck with, well, I don't know either. Because sometimes I'll be doing that. I'll be like, well, I'm going to put it on you. And I don't have any idea of what it is. I'm just like, well, maybe if everyone took time to really know at least what type of food you want, uh, that could be some information that you gained during your singleness. Dexter, why do you think some people uh, are in a rush to get into a relationship? I think a lot of times that people are in a rush to get in a relationship because they they fear waiting. A lot of people, like you think about it, like you, when some people, when they're sitting in a fast food line, if they have to wait more than five minutes for their food, they're upset. And a lot of it's from the perspective of where you are and not the perspective of, of where you're actually going and what actually has to, has to be done to get the result that you want. So like if I want food, if I want, like Paul said, if I want like, you know, steak with the Brussels sprouts with the bacon, if I want lobster mac and cheese, like I can't expect it to be done within five minutes. There's a whole preparation process to prepare the food that I actually want. And a lot of people become impatient in preparation. And that's why they don't want to they don't want to they don't want to wait when it comes to dating. And that's why people are in such a rush because they want to get to the end result, not realizing there's preparation and there's practice that has to be put forth in order for you to get the thing that you actually want. Mm, so that waiting time, people like we're in a fast paced society now. Mm -hmm. Everything is instant. If I want something from downtown, I could easily call up Uber Eats and it get here quick. But when it comes to people, we can't just rent a boyfriend, rent a girlfriend that quickly. And if you can, I'm almost questioning what type of quality person is this if I can just easily mm -hmm. rent them. So that's one of those things. And another thing that I'm hearing is like we want connection. We want connection. We 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 crave it. We desire it. I, I believe we were designed for it. But when it's not readily available, what do you do in the meantime? So here's another area I want to go. We live in a tech age. Social media is showing us the best of every situation. It shows us the highlights. It shows us the vacations. It shows us the accomplishments of what relationships can be. 
It's almost like a never ending highlight reel. Someone's having a baby or baby shower. Someone's having a wedding or an engagement party. It's always in our face. Not to mention if we have friends that many of them are starting to either be in relationships or are married. So there comes a, a struggle where there's external pressure for people to hurry up and jump into a relationship. So my question is, how can people better manage the pressure that comes from social media, from friends? And I haven't even got started on the pressure that comes from family. Paul, how can people better manage that type of pressure not to just rush into a relationship? I think the biggest part is it's almost like I, 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 when I talk to my clients, sometimes we got to look at those things as we're watching a movie. Right. We don't want to be in the movie. We're just watching this entertainment. And maybe we pull ideas from that. And so if you say, I want a relationship that looks like that, but I don't know what's happening behind closed doors. Right. I don't know what's happening. And I don't know the process they got to be there to get connected, to get aligned, to, to build this relationship, have this wedding, to have a baby, to do all these different things. So I, then I look at myself as opposed to saying I should be where they're at. What do I knew? What do I need to do to get to where I want to be? Like, what type of relationship do I want to have? Am I ready for the relationship I said I want to have? Like, have I done my personal work? Because again, sometimes we think we want this ideal woman or we want this ideal man, but what are we going to do when we get them? Are we ready for them? Like, because we still have triggers. We still have things that we have to work on. So while I'm watching that, okay, I can put it as a goal, but I really can't ignore the process. Hmm. What you mm. think, Dexter? Uh, I'm gonna sound real churchy when I say this, but it's all right. So, like, when you like, is y'all said it perfectly? Like, when you're watching the highlight reel of somebody's life, and I love how Paul put it. Like, you're watching a movie, and you're picking out the parts that you like. But you know, whenever you used to, you know, buy a DVD because everything's digital now. So, like, if you buy a movie on Apple or Prime Video or wherever you may buy a movie from. Like whenever you buy the movie, there's always the behind the scenes footage you can always see. Because when you see the behind the scenes footage of how the movie's actually made, sometimes the behind the scenes footage is longer than the actual movie itself. Because now you're seeing how people have to do table reads, how they have to find the right actors, how they have to shoot different scenes and have to shoot that one scene that you like, that was a two minute scene, they shot it over the course of six months. Like a lot of us don't know what actually goes into making a relationship work. Like you don't know what it takes to plan a wedding. Like you may have, like for me, before I got married, like I had a Pinterest board of what I wanted to wear as a, as a, you know, as a groom. But I didn't realize what went into actually planning a wedding. I didn't understand the stresses that come from it, the, the final constraint that comes from it. I had an idea, but I really had no idea until I was actually in it and understood what I was doing. And a lot of us, we get caught up in the, in the fluff of it all, of the beat of the of the surface level beauty of it all, but we don't see the, we don't understand the ugliness that comes out of the beauty of that thing. And here's another thing. I wish people, if they knew what really went on to build a really strong and healthy relationship, people would be slower to jump into them so quickly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that when me and my wife were in Spain, you know, everyone's taking pictures. We saw a couple who were literally sitting there arguing back and forth. She was like, stand here, take it like this, do this, do that, all of this stuff. So much so but that my wife was like, let me take the picture for you. And she took it. Listen, it was probably a bomb picture, but nobody is going to know the fight that happened before they took the picture. No one's going to know that that happened. But people are in a rush to get in the position to take the picture Without realizing, y'all may f listen. There's a reason why me and Allison don't post too many pictures together. <laughs> we be like this. What are you doing? Take it right. Like there's a reason. Like people probably wonder, like, are y'all still together? Yes, we just ain't taking pictures together. <laughs> so but, I think you know, it's you know, it's interesting. People want that picture all the time, so they get mm. in a relationship and they're expecting that highlight all the time. And then when a disconnect comes, they think, you know what? This is not what I thought it was. And then they go and look for another highlight. And so they're jumping from relationship to relationship and falling in love with that honeymoon phase. Like they're honeymooners, constantly mm. jumping into relationships. That's a, I mean, that's love addiction, right? So I'm only excited about the, the, the good parts. But when something comes up that is, it, it causes some type of disconnect, I'm ready to relieve the, lead the relationship and jump to the next honeymoon phase.
Mm, it's like chasing that next high. Like, and, and here's another thing that I really try to explain people clinically, like you, your body, your nervous system can't live at that all time high for an extended period of time. Like you can't do it. It's not physically possible. It's almost similar to like what they, what what would happen to you is similar to what happens to drug addicts. Like they are always trying to get higher and higher and their nervous system becomes desensitized at some point to it. It's crazy how that happens. So here, let's let's transition to this because I want to like really talk about like the weight. So here, here's my question, Paul. What are some things that people can actually do while they're in that waiting phase between relationships? What are some practical things that they can do? Of course, I think, you know, I'm an advocate for therapy. You know, you, you get to know some things. You get to know your blind spots. You get to know your triggers, know how to manage them, know your feelings, your thoughts, everything. Um, that's one. I think, again, travel. You mentioned travel. I didn't realize how to really travel until I traveled by myself. When I Once I took trips by myself, I really got to spend some time with myself, and I know that I didn't have the distraction of another person. So if you want to learn different trades and stuff like that, I, I, I learned how to cook better by myself so now I can present that to whoever I'm with, right? Um, I really did some affirmations. Uh, I did some, I spent a lot of time myself with writing, journaling, all those different things, how I want to be a better person. I practiced forgiveness. That was one thing that I really had to do. And I tell a lot of my clients, especially male clients, we practice, we, we operate in unforgiveness. And that's why we keep making the same decisions over and over again, because we don't think we're better than the mistake. We can't get out of that mistake. That's just who we are. Um, so it's, it's a, a couple of different things, like practical things. Again, um, just spending time with yourself, go, go by yourself to the movies, you know, go for a walk, go to a game, the things that you would love for somebody else to do for you, do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you appreciate it that much more when you don't have to cover the bill by yourself, right? Or you don't have to uh, have the awkwardness of walking into the restaurant by yourself or have the awkwardness of walking to the movie theater by yourself. Um, now you love those things and now you have somebody who you love to enjoy those things with you. Mm. That's yeah. what you think. Yeah, because that's the that's the thing that I did, you know, before, you know, before I met my wife, like we like, we were both like doing our own thing. Like we talked about it as we were like dating. And I would tell her like, I would go. I went to the movies by myself. I went out to eat by myself. I somewhere I wanted to go. I went by myself because I needed to be comfortable with who I was by myself, because before before I made the decision to actively wait and to, you know, be by myself to understand who I was and where I was, you know, spiritually, mentally and emotionally, what I found myself doing in relationships was I was being a chameleon to somebody else, emulating the things that they wanted and in turn not being true to myself. Like, OK, I'm not really in line with this, but I'm going to do this anyway, because that's what you like thinking. I'm I'm serving somebody else, but really I'm doing a disservice to myself because I'm giving them what they want and I'm suffering in the on the back end thinking that I'm that I'm doing being a great significant other and I'm not. So like I 100 percent stand by, you know, being by yourself and understanding what makes you tick, because if you get in a relationship before time, you'll find yourself being that community. You'll find yourself like emailing all those things that they want. And then you're suffering on the back end because you have no idea what you want. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I really am picking up, especially while you wait, there are things you can things you need to be doing. It's not just a sitting around waiting, wishing and hoping for someone to come along, but it's actually a time where you get to develop yourself. I really don't think enough people take time to develop themselves mentally, physically, spiritually during this time. I know for me, I'm, I'm a big advocate for people to, if you've been in multiple bad relationship after bad relationship didn't work, you need to take a break. Like you got to stop, pause, put a halt on it for an extended period of time. For one, I had to I had to unlearn all the bad relational habits that I was constantly practicing. There was something I was doing that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. But you have to give yourself time to build new habits. There's no way to do that if you're going from one relationship to the next just hoping that okay, I'm going to do the same thing and get a different result. And one of the main things that I had to do was unlearn some of the beliefs that I had about relationships. Unlearning the beliefs changed my actions. 
And think about it. Like my my father has been married multiple times. My mom has been married multiple times. I did not have a very congruent or a very positive view of what relationships were supposed to be like. And as a result, they were <laughs> I was acting on a lot of these thought processes that were subconscious. So I think when you're waiting, do these things where you get to rediscover yourself, but also figure out what is it that I need to change? What are some things I need to do differently? And sometimes doing that by yourself can can give you more information than trying to do it on the job. That's what I like. I, a lot of people try to wait until they're in a relationship to start trying to practice how they communicate. No, practice communicating when you go to the movie theater. Ask the person uh, <laughs> to what give them your order. And if they get it wrong, kindly let them know again. There's so, obviously some miscommunication. No, excuse me. I wanted my popcorn without butter. You actually put it with butter. Can I please get it? That's practicing communication skills that directly translate into a relationship. And so I think those are things that we can be doing while we're waiting. So I have another question. A lot of people have FOMO, which is fear of missing out. What are some ways that we can address that feeling that, oh, man, everybody else is experiencing love, joy, happiness, and I'm not? Paul, how can people better address that FOMO when it comes to relationships? I think first, I mean, the, the bottom line is finding that for yourself. Like, how can I give that to me? The other thing is, I think people really skip over, really don't pay attention to is the circle. Like your circle of friends provide a level of love and joy and support that you may need, right? And I'm not dependent solely on a partner to give me all those things. I have my true, honest, genuine, uh, friendships with integrity, with boundaries, where we haven't crossed anything. There's no romantic uh, connections to them, but a genuine friendship because we learn how to communicate. We learn how to connect with our friends. And while I'm not having that partner yet, I do have a tribe. I do have connection um, and to relying on that. And so when you're thinking about, uh, I wish I had love, I have somebody I can talk to about that. Like, I, I wish I had this type of love. I have a, a friend that we can go hang out like, yo, let's go get some drinks or let's go get something to eat or whatever that is. Let's go take a, a fellas trip or let's take a ladies trip or something like that and just bond together so we can hold each other accountable before we just jump in another relationship thinking that that will solve all the problems. And the next thing you know, six months later, I'm back on your couch, upset, I'm angry, and I'm, I'm going back in the cycle. Mm. FOMO, Dexter. <laughs> what, what you got? <laughs> FOMO. I mean... But the best way I can put it is perspectives. Perspective is one of the clinical agents when it comes to fear, because for a lot of people, a lot of us have this detrimental like perspective when it comes to the fear of missing out. And when reality, we're not missing out on, on anything, because when you understand where you are for yourself and understand like the perspective of what you really have around you, your perspective shifts and it changes. So it's like Paul said, when you look at your life and you see like the people that are actually around you, you're able to assess that friendship circle. You can see like, oh, I have this kind of friend that does this, this friend that does this. I have this kind of tribe surrounding me. I have these kind of family members surrounding me. But that's something that I had to do, you know, realize like, the kind of people I had around me. Like I had, you know, parents that were, you know, pushing me in the way I was trying to go as far as my career. I had a loving grandmother. I had my grandfather. I had... You know, my college friends who were like there for me, like if it, I needed anything, I could call them and talk to them, which I did. And I used that in that time of being of being by myself and understood that, you know, who Dexter was by himself was I was OK. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, we're not supposed to be alone. You know, I mean, having that desire for being for being with someone and being a significant other and having companionship. There was nothing wrong with that. But I didn't I understood that I didn't even make that my idol. I needed to make that a goal, but I didn't need to make it my idol. And once I understood that, I understood that I wasn't missing out on anything, that I was just in preparation for the next stage of my life. <laughs> you you want to know what's funny? FOMO bites me every time I think about getting a new iPhone. So, so I tend to watch a lot of tech blogs and they're always talking about how good and how great this next iPhone is going to be. The performance, the cameras, like none we've ever seen. And then I will like, you know what? I should, I should. And then I rush to go get it. And I'm like, man, this isn't what they were selling it to be. And it, it, it got me so bad one year that I was like, you know what? Whatever phone I got is the phone I'm going to rock with. I'm going to wait until there's something that I know for sure 
is 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 better and is out there and i'm going to try to reach it so we're going to go ahead and transition into our last segment of the show which is our flip the script and flip the script is the segment of the show where our guests provide a simple tool or strategy to address a specific challenge or situation that we discuss in the episode so paul you ready yep someone may be out there listening and they're like you know what i have been very impatient while i've been waiting I've been a little antsy. Um, I've gotten into some relationships I probably shouldn't have. And I think it's because I feel like I'm running out of time. What can people do to remind themselves that they can be patient on their waiting journey and that they indeed are not running out of time like they may think? I think the first thing is ask yourself if those relationships that fail, let's let's do some self-evaluation. Let's put them, you can you can put the other person in there, but ask yourself, were you ready for that relationship? And so if you would think that you were in that relationship and you were just, everything would have worked out and how bad it was that it got to the end, remember that part. So while you're waiting and while you're working, remind yourself that you're in a position, you're not at the destination. So when you're afraid of time running out, time doesn't run out. Like when you find the person, your person, they'll find you at the same time because you're doing the work that you need to do. So you're in position to receive what you need. And maybe back then you weren't in position to receive what you need. Or maybe if you did, you might have fumbled it. So know that all those things, you never wasted any time with any other relationships. You just learned about you. You learned about them and you learned what you wanted. And so now you're continuously working to the point to be in the relationship that you need. All right. And there you guys have it. Paul, thank you for joining us this week. No problem, man. My pleasure. So let everybody know where they can find you on the internet and social media. So you can find me at Bache Williams on everything. My Facebook, Bache Williams. My Instagram is Bache Williams. Win Love Alliance is we, we and my wife, my wife and I. Uh, my website is BacheWilliams.com. If you're looking for therapy, um, it's Heart to Mind Counseling. That's pretty much you go Google Bache Williams and you'll find me. All right. Now we'll put all of his information down in the show notes. We thank everybody for taking time out of their morning to listen or whenever you listen to it. Please head on over to iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher Podcast, comment, rate, and subscribe. If you're in YouTube land, I'm mean, excuse me, if you're in podcast land, jump on over to YouTube to Love Unscripted HD, where you can see the full episode for this video. Also, don't forget to follow Dexter at Love on My Sleeve on instagram and i think that's about it yo we may not have all the answers but we will have the conversation i'll see y'all next time peace